welcome. My name is Delphine Algan, and I'm the executive director of the Signals Network. And I'm honored to introduce you and animate today's conversation. I would like to thank the Logan Symposium for organizing the conversation entitled Blowing the Whistle. I would like to thank you, Tyler, uh, for accepting the invitation to discuss your experience uh, with us today. So yeah. for the full disclosure, I think I should say that we know each other a little bit um, because we both live normally in the San Francisco Bay Area, but more importantly, uh, you have been on the board of uh, the Signals Network, the nonprofit I founded three years ago. And uh, at the Signals Network, we support whistleblowers uh, who have shared public interest information with the press. And uh, we help whistleblowers and journalists to work together in order to hold powerful interest accountable. So that's kind of, I hope, why it made sense for you to accept to help us. And now the Signals Network is operational in 11 countries, the US and 10 European countries. And that's countries where we support whistleblowers who have shared information with the press. And for some logic reason, I cannot say publicly who they are, but they are whistleblowers who are behind um, some of the major story of our time from Me Too stories to corruption, to stories linked to the coronavirus or health hazards. And they shared information with media like the New York Times, NPR, The Guardian, BBC, Der Spiegel, and so on. And most of them come to us from journalists or general counsel of media who advise them to talk to us if they want to talk to a lawyer or get legal advice, and then we, we help them. So, and in parallel at the Signals Network, we work with media committed to protect their sources and to work on collaboration uh, and investigation based on information provided by whistleblower. And we already have coordinated the publication of two major investigations uh, with media in the US and Europe, like Bitsight, El Mundo, Mediapart, Radio France, and, and so on. And actually the last one was related to plasma donation uh, and was published in July. So on our board, we have whistleblowers like Tyler, Antoine Deltour, the LuxLix whistleblowers, or lawyers like Ben Wisner from ACLU, online security expert and so on. And, and they all bring expertise and experience in order to protect those who, who take risk to share public uh, interest information with the press and to hold powerful interest accountable. And so basically you, Tyler, you hold a $10 billion company accountable, Terranos, and that's quite of a story. And I'm, I'm really excited to, to discuss it again with you to, today. And for those of you who have not read the amazing book, uh, Bad Blood, written by the Wall Street Journal journalist, John Carreyrou, or for those of who have not seen the HBO documentary, The Inventor, or for those of you who have not listened to Tyler's podcast, uh, Thicker Than Water, and I, I, I will talk about this podcast a lot because I, I listen to it and it's really amazing and I, I would recommend to any, everyone to, to listen to it, Thicker Than Water, uh, uh, available on Audible. So for all of you who don't know about uh, Tyler's story, I will just start by asking Tyler to, to explain the whole process again, like from being a young uh, graduate, graduate uh, from Stanford University hired by an exciting company called Terranos to, to be called by the Wall Street Journal uh, a whistleblower. What's, what was this journey? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and really from being excited to join a company to, to, to leave uh, hell, uh, and hope and I, thanks God recover from all this. So, so yeah, Tyler, sorry again. Can you tell us your story? Yeah, sure. I'll uh, I'll tell it in the briefest way possible, so we can dive into some other other of your questions. But 
Uh, yeah, so I first met Elizabeth Holmes in my grandfather's living room because I was a junior at Stan Stanford University at the time. He worked at Stanford University and I got, I just got a phone call from him one day that, and he said, I have this brilliant woman coming over to my house for lunch. So it'd be great if you could come over and just listen in on this discussion. So I had almost no context, but I went over there and that was the first time that I heard Elizabeth tell the vision of Theranos, which I instantly fell in love with. Um, so anything that a central laboratory could do, Theranos could do by just testing a single drop of blood from your fingertip. And you could do this in point of care settings. And she mentioned things like medevac helicopters and battlefields and operating rooms and drug stores. Uh, so it sounded like this was a truly revolutionary technology. And on top of that, she had this very compelling story of dropping out of Stanford when she was 19 years old to start this company. So she kind of seemed like the female Steve Jobs. She even dressed mm -hmm. like Steve Jobs. Um, so I definitely fell into the hype along with everybody else. And I, I walked away from my first meeting with her thinking that this was something that I absolutely had to be involved with. So I followed up with her and was able to get myself an internship uh, between my junior and senior year of college. So um, during my internship, I worked in a research lab with um, all of my coworkers had never seen a Theranos device before. I never saw a Theranos device while I worked there. And I think my, probably the biggest takeaway from my internship was that secrecy was taken extremely seriously at Theranos. Uh, there were barricades up everywhere. You weren't supposed to talk to other labs about what you were working on in your lab. A lot of senior scientists had never even seen the product they were working on. They had never seen the Theranos technology. They didn't even know what it was. Um, Theranos was deep in stealth mode at the time. Nobody, supposedly no one outside of Theranos knew that they were even in diagnostics. Um, so I kind of felt like I was working at the CIA almost. It was like, I couldn't say anything about my job. And then I went back to Stanford. Uh, but you loved it. You loved working there as an intern. I did. I really enjoyed working there as an intern. Um, I continued to kind of build my relationship with Elizabeth. And at that time, she was becoming a little bit integrated into my family. She started coming to our family Christmas parties and birthday parties and Thanksgivings and things like that. Um, so it was almost like she was becoming one of my cousins. Mm -hmm. um, so my relationship definitely grew while I was working uh, as an intern. Um, so then I went back to Stanford, finished up my senior year, uh, spent the summer traveling through Europe, playing guitar on the street, had a great time, and then came back and started working full time at Theranos. And my first day was the day that they launched the product. So finally, they came out of stealth mode. They told the world what they were doing, how they were going to revolutionize healthcare. So it was a super exciting time for that to be your first day as a full time employee. But at the same time, the manager of the assay validation team, which was the team that was in charge of making sure that these tests worked, quit on that same day in a very dramatic way. I was told she was crying in the parking lot. Um, and then I had a team meeting with my, with my manager who essentially told us that even though we launched the product, that there were no tests being run on the product. Every test that we collected from the first Walgreens that launched uh, was being run on third party equipment or sent out to outside labs. And on top of that, they weren't even collecting finger pricks. So essentially people were going into Walgreens, getting a needle in their arm, drawing blood. They would bring it back to Theranos. Theranos would run it on third party equipment or send it to labs like UCSF and, and Quest Diagnostics and things like that. Um, so it was really confusing. It, it was a very confusing first day. And a couple days after that, uh, we got an email from Sunny, who was the president and COO of the company, telling all of the research labs that we should stop our experiments because we were all being moved to this assay validation team, which was the team that had their, their manager quit. And that's when I started working with the Theranos product. And right off the bat, you can see that there's nothing revolutionary about it. There's just a pipette inside of a box. So there was nothing that that Theranos device could do that I couldn't do with my own hand by moving a pipette, which is just a simple liquid handling cheap instrument in almost every lab in the world. Um, so it was very underwhelming and it could only run one test at a time. 
So even if we did have 300 tests validated on this system, if you went and ordered 300 tests, it would need to be run on 300 different devices. So, so basically that's when you were able to see by with your own eyes that what was promoted by Terranos, which supposedly this wonderful new machine who could do 300 tests thanks to one, um, one, uh, one drop. yeah. <laughs> did not did not exist and could do not even one test at a time and that was when you because you were able to be to access the machine which was not the case for a lot of employees yeah so that was a huge red flag um it also wasn't a standalone system so you needed to use it in combination with other um like liquid handling robots um and during the, on your podcast, you even say that you had to manually close the door or, <laughs> yeah. or make the heat uh, go down uh, with your hand or. Yeah, it was, it had some engineering defects. So like the door that you would put the cartridge in sometimes wouldn't close. So we would have to tape it shut with tape. Um, there were barcode scanners on the cartridges that the device would scan it and it would know what tests to run but often the barcode scanner wouldn't even work. So we would rip the, car the barcodes off, put it on a pair of scissors and six scissors into the device and try to get it to scan. It would often be too hot. So we'd cool it down. We'd open the door, try to wave our hands. Sometimes it would be too cold and we'd have little blankets that we could put over it. Um, tips would so fall we are, off. We are talking about the machine, which is supposed to be the gold mine of, a, at that time was the company already valued at $10 billion? It was shortly afterwards valued at $10 billion. I'm not sure what it was valued at when I started working there, but it was, you know, right around that time, it was valued at $9 billion. And I think that valuation came because Elizabeth was essentially saying this revolutionary technology is going to upend the entire laboratory diagnostics industry and Quest Diagnostics is worth $9 billion. Therefore, we are worth $9 billion because we are going to take all of their business. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were very bold and aggressive um and had really had no technology yeah um, but sorry go so, ahead and tell us about your journey working there yeah. yeah so then there were some a few other red flags where when regulators came in to actually give us our CLIA certifications so that we could be a certified central laboratory they were not shown the room that had the Theranos devices and the doors to the to the room that had the Theranos devices were locked that day we were not supposed to go in or out of that room so the regulators, we got our, our CLIA certification without the regulators ever seeing a Theranos device. So that was a huge red flag. And then we were, we essentially participated in a, a kind of audit or like a safety inspection where we're supposed to test a sample and, and give the results to a third party who knows the answer. And so when we got that, we split it and we ran it on the Theranos platform and third party equipment. And in some cases, the results were off by more than 300%. And we reported the results from the third party equipment, even though at that time we were actually running patient samples on the Theranos product. Because uh, after I joined that validation team, we ended up expanding the test menu from zero tests up to seven. So by the time I left, we were running seven tests on the Theranos platform. Mm -hmm. um, so all these red flags were kind of building up for me. And so I actually, well, I talked to a lot of my, my coworkers, the senior scientists, they were all seeing the exact same things. And so I went and I actually confronted Elizabeth about some of these things. And she kind of brushed them off a little bit, said, oh, I'll set you up with a meeting with a vice president to go over these things. I went and I met with the vice president. He also kind of brushed them off, kind of said like, yeah, some things we didn't do perfectly, but it's not that big of a deal. And I've, I eventually just asked him, I said, do you actually think that this test is better than tests that already exist? And he said, I don't think we've ever claimed to be better than other technologies, which was mind blowing to me because that was that was like the whole point of Theranos was that we're, we're better than the conventional technologies. Um, but I went and, and then I, you, you said that actually it's the syphilis tests that made you decide to quit. Yeah, so the syphilis test was the one that broke the camel's back for me because I was doing the validation for that test. So I was making sure it was safe before we, we started running real patient samples. And I saw that our coefficient of variation at the cutoff level was 
which means that the standard deviation was 43% of the value. So the, the variation was enormous. And then we tested samples that were known to be positive for syphilis and we only got 65% correct. And we pretty much pretended like that didn't happen and we tried again and we got 80% correct the second time. Then we did a study where we compared uh, results from a finger prick versus a venous draw. And for that, we collected samples from ourselves and from our colleagues and an alarming percentage of us tested positive for syphilis. And <laughs> we literally laughed about it. And the manager, our manager said, guys, it's not impossible. <laughs> and we like, no one sent out a company wide email. No one went and got retested. Everyone just assumed the test didn't work. And so we put all this data together and sent it to the statistics team. And to our surprise, it passed validation requirements. So they said, okay, this is safe. And we're going to start testing real patients using this test. And that was the point for me where I thought, I know without a doubt that someone is going to be severely hurt by this test because if you have syphilis and you get tested and you test positive and you get treated, it's not that big of a deal. But mm -hmm. if you get tested and it says you're negative when you actually do have it, you can spread it to other people. It can eventually become a life-threatening disease. Um, so to me, this felt like a really, really big deal. And that's when I went and confronted Elizabeth. Um, and... Um, and when you confronted her asking question and, and still trying to, to make Terranos work and do what they were saying they were doing. I mean, I think you came to her by saying, I don't understand and how could we fix that? And I the did, answer yeah. was... See ya. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I ultimately wrote Elizabeth a pretty long email where I just said, you know, this is something that I see um, here's data to support what I see, and here's something that I think we can do to fix it. And at the end of the email, I said, I do not mean for this to be attacking in any way. I'm, I'm committed to the long-term vision of this company, and I'm worried that our current practices will prevent us from reaching our bigger goals. And she forwarded it to Sunny, and Sunny responded saying that I was arrogant, ignorant, patronizing, reckless, had no understanding of basic math, science, or statistics, and that if I had any other last name that I would have already been held accountable in the strongest way, uh, which was so a very actually, let, Maybe let's take a, a minute because I don't, if, if nobody knows about this, why the, your last name matters here. You mentioned briefly that you met Elizabeth at your grandfather's house, um, but you did not describe if someone doesn't know um, why it matters and who is your grandfather and why, in a sense, it allowed, your grandfather allowed you to enter Terranos and then allowed you a certain level of access and protection for time. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I accidentally skipped over that part. So about the time where I joined full time, my grandfather also joined the board. So we kind of started about at the same time, I think. Um, so yeah, who so. is your grandfather? Oh, yeah. And so my grandfather uh, was the Secretary of State for Ronald Reagan. He was Secretary of Treasury and Labor for Richard Nixon. Um, so he's been, yeah, so he had a long career in, in politics. And also, he was, he was also the CEO of Bechtel Corporation, which is a really big... Um, and I mean, you say, you say it in a very Wikipedia way, uh, but the, the reality is that it means that when you were a kid, uh, you played with your bicycle in the in, in the foot of Gorbachev that uh, uh, President Bush was hanging out at your grandfather's garden. So that's, yeah. that's, that's what it means. <laughs> yeah, so it was kind of funny because I, I had a very, very normal California life. You know, I, my, my dad is a high school biology teacher. My mom was a nurse. Um, and then we would kind of go from that world into my grandfather's world where it's like, okay, we're having dinner with Henry Kissinger. And, you know, on one occasion, uh, we ended up sitting in the backyard with George Bush. He was gonna go speak at Stanford, but there were protests that prevented him from getting there. So he went to my grandfather's house where we just happened to be. And so we just hung out with George Bush for about an hour in my grandfather's backyard while he was the president. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it was def definitely had some unique experiences, yeah. So that's worth taking a second to explain who is your grandfather. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, yeah, so then he joined the board of Theranos and when he joined, he also brought a lot of his 
his friends over. So he, he brought over um, people like Jim Mattis, who was the soon to be Secretary of Defense, uh, Henry Kissinger, another former Secretary of, of State, um, and a, hand, a handful of others as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, when you brought up your concerns in a very factual, non-aggressive way to Elizabeth, you got an answer from um, Sonny, who was the, the president of the company, saying, if you were not who you are, we, we would have smashed you, something like that. <laughs> yeah, but he was very vague about it. He said, would have been held accountable in the strongest way, which mm. is like, does that mean fired or does that mean something worse? <laughs> I don't know. So, but you kind of get a sense of what it meant uh, when you answered to him. And what did you answer? Uh, mm -hmm. So I just said, consider this my two weeks notice. Um, if you prefer I leave today, that's fine with me as well. And unsurprisingly, they preferred that I left that day. So, yeah. So that was the, um, the end of your work experience. So you worked there for eight months and you yeah, worked a months. lot, you worked night shifts and you... Yeah, I worked, and... worked around the clock often. <laughs> um, actually, there's one more detail that I think is pretty important to our conversation. And that is that I actually reached out to the New York State Department of Health Yes. about one of my concerns. And when I did that, I was, you know, I knew how seriously Theranos took all of their, their secrets. So I did not want that to be traced back to me. Um, so I made up a fake email account and I contacted the New York State Department of Health and I didn't even tell them where I worked. I didn't tell them what tests we were running. I was very, very vague. I just said that these were, I just described the processes that had taken place. And they responded and said, this is a form, this is a violation of our, of our regulations. It's a form of cheating on that audit that I, I previously described. And they asked for the name of the company so that they could reach out to them to improve their practices. And I asked if I could do that anonymously. And they said, only if I reported it to what they called the laboratory investigative unit. Um, and so they gave me that email. And so I anon I'm anonymously with a fake email um, so my, my fake alias was anonymous. <laughs> I, yes. I, I emailed this laboratory investigative unit and I never heard back. Yeah. And years later, John Carreyrou, who, who I'm sure we are going to talk about here pretty soon, um, followed up with them. And he says that essentially what happened was they thought that this was a, a federal, um, like a federal matter, not a New York state matter. And so they forwarded the complaint to the Center of Medicare and Medicaid Services. So CMS is the overarching regulatory bottle for, uh, body for central laboratories. And CMS says that they never received the complaint. So laboratory investigative unit says they send it to CMS. CMS says they never saw it. So yeah, let, let's go back to the failure of regulators later, but let, let's move on. So you, you quit Terranos uh, in April 2014. Yeah. Then things go OK for a while. For a while, until I had Thanksgiving dinner with her after that. Yeah. <laughs> that was um, awkward moment. Awkward, a little bit awkward, yeah. And then, then when did so you have a new job, you're happy, you have a good life, Theranos is behind you, just this awkward relationship with Elizabeth and your grandfather, but no crisis. And right. then what, what's happened? Yeah, so I thought Theranos was completely behind me. Um, and then John Carreyrou reached out to me on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah. he just after you he, checked his profile he saw that <laughs> yeah so the slightly longer story yeah. is that is that john reached out to a few other theranos former theranos employees who told me they, they said oh look this investigative journalist is reaching out to me about theranos so then i looked at his linkedin page just to kind of see what his background was he saw that i looked at his linkedin page and then messaged me um and i ignored him for about a month i talked to um, one of my former managers at Theranos about it. I talked to my parents about it. Everyone said, don't talk to him. You're only going to create a whole lot of trouble for yourself. Stay out of it. Move on with your life. And so I tried to do that for about a month. But I had, I just, every single day I was thinking about what he knew, what the angle of the story was. 
and if there was basically a way that I could help. And it just, I tried so hard to not talk to him, but it was like a compulsion. I just had to. So eventually I bought a burner phone with cash and I called him and I was surprised at how open he was with me about what he knew. Because up, up until that point, every time I talked about Theranos with someone, we would literally be checking our shoulders to see who would be listening. Everyone was very, very guarded. And he just kind of laid out all of these problems that I, I've already kind of laid out here. And he said that um, he had a source that was well above my pay grade. And he was really looking for uh, corroborating sources. And in that call, I told him that my grandfather was part of the Nixon administration during Watergate, part of the Reagan administration during the Iran-Contra scandal, and made it out of both of those with his integrity completely intact. So I was sure that if he was given the opportunity that he would make things right with the people that Elizabeth has hurt. And I would want the truth about Theranos to come out sooner rather than later. So I agreed to be a deep background source for his reporting. Yeah, so he explained to you, okay, you could be off the record, on background, or on the record, and you agreed to be uh, on background. Right, I agreed to be background, yeah. Um, At that moment. And then things start to go bad. And then things go sideways, yeah. I thought that I would be, I thought that I could stay anonymous forever. I thought, oh, burn your phone with cash. No one can ever figure out that, that I... I spoke to him. So then you, you said that basically when you talked to John, he was pretty advanced in his own investigations. So quickly after that, he sent question to Tejanos. Yeah, so I ended up forwarding him the email exchange that I had with Elizabeth and Sonny. And he used one number from that email to probe Theranos. He said, yeah. Uh, like one of my sources said that for TSH, the coefficient of variation is as high as 42.9%. And they saw that 42.9% and said that came from Tyler Schultz. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I ended up actually going home to have dinner with my parents one night. And my dad had just gone off the phone with my grandfather. And he said that Theranos knows that I was speaking to the Wall Street Journal. And I said, there's no way they actually know. This is a yeah. real reporter. I... Mm -hmm. Trust did my him. research on him and he had actually won a Pulitzer Prize before. So this was not like a- And he investigated healthcare and he got right. some real impact from his investigation. So yeah, you trust right. him. I, I didn't just willy nilly pick up the phone and start blabbing about Theranos. I made sure that it was somebody who would actually be responsible with the information beforehand. So I told my parents, there's no way they actually know. There's no way the reporter just gave me up like that. There's yeah. just no way. So I, uh, I ended up calling my grandfather and, and he, he said that um, in order to protect their trade secrets, Theranos needed me to sign a one page non-disclosure agreement, uh, which sounded kind of weird, but I said, sure, that's fine with me. But before I talk to the Theranos lawyers tomorrow morning, can I just come over to your house and talk to you tonight? And he said, yeah, sure, no problem. So I went over to his house. I rehashed all my old conversations with him. He said that Elizabeth assured him that they were going above and beyond what was required of them from the FDA and, and that he spoke to surgeons who said it, was, it would revolutionize the field of surgery and that these devices were already being used in medevac helicopters and they're already being used in in operating rooms at UCSF. And so the difference in reality was just so large that there was no way we were gonna find common ground. Mm. And he said, well, whatever the case may be, will you sign a one page non-disclosure agreement? And I said, yes, I have no problem signing that. Mm. And so he said, well, actually there's two lawyers here right now. Can I go get them? <laughs> and I was completely blindsided by that. He went and got the lawyers and they did not give me a one page non-disclosure agreement. They gave me a notice to appear in court on Friday morning. And this was a Wednesday night. They gave me a, an application for a temporary restraining order. And they gave me a strongly worded letter signed by David Boyce, who I did not know at the time. And, and so that's kind of surprised your grandfather. And at that moment, he kind of went on your side by saying, hey, that's not what we talked about. Yeah, so I argued with their lawyers for a long time and then eventually my grandfather got frustrated and kind of kicked them out of the house. And then we called Elizabeth and he said, we were trying to have a discussion. You sent over a litigator 
tomorrow I want you to send different lawyers and I want you to send a non -paid, the one page non-disclosure agreement like we had discussed. Mm -hmm. But of course, the next day comes and the same two lawyers come over to his house. They bring an affidavit, not a non-disclosure agreement, which essentially says, my name is Tyler Schultz, I'm 24 years old. I have not spoken to the Wall Street Journal, but here's a list of names of people who I know have. And I was, I was adamant with them at that point that I had not spoken to the Wall Street Journal. I, yeah. I did not want to tell them that. Yeah. And so we ended up bickering over that for a while. Um, I ended up not signing it. And I, to make a long story a little bit shorter, I ended up getting connected with a legal team. And for probably about four months, it seemed like within two or three or four days, we were going to be in a courtroom battle with Theranos. And Theranos hired private investigators to follow me and my legal team. And they hired uh, this lawyer, David Boyce. And that, yeah. that's maybe worth explaining why it was such a big warning sign when you tell any lawyer that that's the lawyer in, on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, when I'm given that first affidavit, I eventually just said, you know, Elizabeth has had, had lawyers look at this with her best interests in mind. So now I wanna have a lawyer look at this with my best interests in mind. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather was very frustrated and said, okay. And so he said, if his personal attorney said it was okay to sign, would I sign it? I said, mm -hmm. sure. So he went to go fax the affidavit and I went outside and I called his lawyer. And I said, my grandfather is about to send you something and he's gonna tell you to tell me that I have to sign it, but you have to tell him that I cannot sign it. And he was just kind of like, whoa, 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 okay, uh, slow down, who's representing them? And I said, someone named David Boyes. And he just went, holy shit, do you know who that is? And he described how he um, has been involved in so many high profile cases like uh, Gore v. Bush, Napster versus the, U the US government. Um, he, he and, to Harvey Weinstein. Um, yeah, Harvey Weinstein, and he was involved in hiring private investigators to follow around the women involved in that story. Um, now he's representing Jeffrey Epstein's victims, which is the other side of the coin. Harvey Weinstein, Epstein's yeah. victims. But basically, he's known to be a corporate gun or something like that. Yeah, he's. I was told that he's known as the number one corporate gun in America. So, so as soon as your family lawyer here, his name is like, okay, come to my office. We need to, to do proper legal work. <laughs> right. So then I, I went and told the Theranos lawyers, I, I said, this lawyer says I need to go to San Francisco to, to talk with him. And I was in Palo Alto, just like 45 minutes away. And they said, okay, you can go consult with this lawyer, but you need to be back here at two o'clock. You need to be back here at two o'clock. And I said, yes, I'll be back here at two o'clock. And I went and I met with this lawyer and he's, he just goes, there's no way you're going to go meet with them at two o'clock. <laughs> there's no chance. And basically that was this first day of months of legal hell. Yeah. Uh, so of I, you I, being I, threatened to go to court anytime, pressure, you, you were tipped that you were followed. Uh, you could not talk to your parents about what was going on. You were you had many legal teams. You were spending a fortune on lawyers. Yeah, I, I, I was. Um, yeah, so I went to bed that first night with a notice to appear in court the following morning. And when mm -hmm. I woke up, I luckily had an email from the Theranos lawyers saying that they would give me more time to negotiate. And that started this cycle of we're going to court and then I would think, all right, we're going to court. And then they would say, we're going to give you more time to negotiate. And it was just like that on cycle for, for, for months. Um, and so, yeah, I ended up racking up hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees. My parents said that if we did end up going to court, that they would have to sell their house to pay for my legal fees. But, that, that, but they were totally willing to do that but they begged me not to make them do that. They just said, sign whatever it is they're asking you to sign. This is not your battle. And essentially I just, I said that I was not gonna sign the affidavits that Theranos was pre pressuring me to sign because I wasn't gonna sign something under penalty of perjury that I knew was not true. And mm -hmm. I'm not allowed to say exactly what was in those affidavits, 
but the gist of it is I wasn't going to say something that was not true under penalty yeah. of perjury. And yeah. they were asking me to say things that I did not believe were true. So awful, awful summer. And then the article comes out. Yeah, so finally the Wall Street Journal article comes out and I've just been waiting and waiting and waiting for it. Um, as, as it comes close to publication, I think a lot of the pressure is relieved off of me and Theranos kind of realizes that they have bigger problems than me. <laughs> um, and that becomes especially true after the article comes out. But even after that article came out, they did not go down. They, they went down swinging. So, uh, but first, the article. So you you're scared, and I'm at the same time excited to know the articles comes out. And what's your reaction? What do you think when the articles comes out? Yeah. So my initial reaction, and I've actually not talked to John about this. I'm curious what he would say. But my initial reaction was that the first article was was pretty weak, because I knew that John had way more information than what appeared in that first article. And when I read it, I was terrified because I thought what is in this article is not going to bring Theranos down. They're going to recover. And when they do, they're going to destroy me. They are going so to- You know, it's interesting down. because most of the whistleblower I worked around in investigation, I can feel that they're a little disappointed when sometimes the articles comes out because they feel mm -hmm. like, come on, you know much more. Why didn't you put it out there? Yeah. But generally, they're happy because also it's a fair portrait. But right. Yeah. So just as a side note. But uh, what I didn't quite realize was that John had articles that were already planned and in the works. And it was an ongoing story. I, for yeah. some reason, in my mind, I thought it was there was going to be one article and then it was going to be done. And, and also, so he happened, had also probably his own legal restraint. And yeah, I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did. Um, but so, over so the first impression of was not the right one in a sense because then a lot of other articles came out and other media picked up yeah and it just got worse and worse and worse and for a while i think theranos was threatening to like sue the wall street journal they were sending them cease and desist letters they were fighting every article that came out and eventually i think they just kind of gave in they stopped sending those to the wall street journal and but also uh, because the regulators woke up. Yeah. Yeah, so they ended up being investigated by the FDA and, and the Center for Medi Medicare and Medicaid Services. And they ended up saying that um, Theranos had practices that jeopardized patients' health. So they weren't allowed to run a lab for two years, something like that. Then the SEC ended up investigating and said that Theranos was guilty of a massive years long fraud, prevented her from running a, a publicly traded company for 10 years, gave her a little fine. Um, and the Department of Justice has also been investigating and that is still an ongoing matter. So it's, I mean, to this day, it's actually still a developing story. Yeah. And I, actually I found it fascinating that you said in your podcast, that then you've, you considered that your decision to speak on the record was one of the best decision you, you took. And I found it fascinating. And I'm even wondering, and you also said that you don't have any regret going through all that. I'm, I'm actually wondering, don't you regret that you should have speak on the record earlier? Um, Sorry, I two questions. I, I think I went on the record at the right time. Going on the record earlier for me, I think would have just made it so much worse. I think it would have been even more of a disaster. I think if I went on the record from the very get-go, I think Theranos would have sued me. I think I would have spent $2 million in a courtroom instead of a few hundred thousand staying out of a courtroom. Uh, I really do believe that. But why do so, you believe it was the best decision of your life, uh, one of the best to, to speak on the record? I think it was one of the best because I was so incredibly stressed and depressed and angry. And even after the Wall Street Journal came out with their first article in October 2015. So a year after the Wall Street Journal article first came out, my grandfather was still on the board. The board released a statement saying that it had that Elizabeth had their full support. Um, and I felt like they were still pushing me around. So. I learned 
So about a, after not talking to John for about a year, mm -hmm. he came to the Stanford University campus where I was working at the time. And I ended up going to meet up with him. And a couple of days later, the Theranos lawyers told me that they were aware that I was meeting with the Wall Street Journal reporter again. So to me, that meant that oh, after over a year, they still had private investigators either following me or following John. They had yeah. some source that was keeping tabs on us. And that just pissed me off, to be frank. Um, I felt like I had been proven to be right. And the yeah. fact that they were still bullying me just pissed me off. And I felt I hadn't told the story of the, the lawyers That's hiding in my grandfather's house. Yeah. And I felt like I had this great story that they, sh they should be terrified of me. They should be respecting, mm -hmm. they should be respecting me. I've been proven to be right. And they weren't, they kept pushing me around. And so eventually I just felt like, why am I the one who feels like they need to hide? Theranos mm -hmm. needs to hide. And I'm, I'm not ashamed of anything that I've done. I, everything that I've done, I'm happy for that to be public. So I'm going on the record with everything that I've done. I'm gonna put my name to this story and I'm gonna stand up for myself. I'm not gonna hide anymore. And after I did that, it was, a, it was just a huge relief. So when was the article published with you on the record? Uh, I went on the record, that was uh, November 16th, 2016. So one year after the first article published by Trump. Yeah, a little more after, a little longer than one year. And wow. part of the reason I did that also was because my grandfather was on the board and I thought that's fine. Like if he wants to make the decision to support them, that's, I came to terms with that. I, I said, that's fine with me that he's made that choice, but I'm going to make him do it publicly. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was part of my, my reasoning. And once I went on the record, he did resign from the board. And then David Boyce also resigned and that kind of opened the door, like the floodgates for their whole board kind of resigning. So basically the, the you talking on the record is kind of the beginning of the end of your trouble. It really was, yeah. Um, I could finally tell my friends about what I was going through because I was supposed to keep all of, you know, my legal troubles to myself, not tell anybody about anything that was going on. And I did that. And so I wasn't talking to anybody. So finally I could talk to my friends. I could talk to my girlfriend, I could talk to my parents more openly, my siblings. It was just a huge relief for me to not have to keep all this bottled up. Yeah. And it was also that that moment that your grandfather had to resign and uh, it's you where you started slowly to speak again, and uh, that was also the way to to getting back together uh, as a grandson and grandfather. Um, but maybe let me. I am. Um, I want to ask you what what did you learn from talking and working with uh, a journalist like John, and if you had any advice for other potential tech worker or who's thinking of maybe share some important information with a journalist what do you think they should know or yeah, yeah. well I, mean, I think the the big thing is um you have to be able to trust this person so you got to do a lot of research and one of the things that that i did like i mentioned before i researched i read his past his past work I knew that he had won a Pulitzer Prize, so I knew he was a serious reporter. So when there came the time when I was kind of being told that the reporter kind of gave you up, I knew that that couldn't have been true. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, was con I was confident in my relationship with John Carreyrou. And I think it's important to have that. So, um, and we had, we had also met um, beyond that first phone call, he flew out to, to California and we had, had met up over a beer um, and so I didn't know him that well, but I, I knew him well enough to know that I, I could trust him, that he wasn't going to just hand me over. Um, and then I think another thing is that you have to be confident that this reporter is going to going to see it through till the end. Yeah. And what I didn't know at the time, but learned later was that there was an enormous amount of pressure on the Wall Street Journal to kill the story. Mm. Um, David Boyce went over there. They had very, very long conversations where yeah. David Boyce threatening them. Um, John, Elizabeth, descri John described that in his book, I remember. Yeah, um, there's some re like little recordings of it show up in the documentary, The Inventor, which is 
pretty enlightening to actually get to hear parts of those conversations. Um, and then Elizabeth, so Rupert Murdoch, who owns the Wall Street Journal, invested $125 million in Theranos. And so Elizabeth went to Rupert Murdoch, I was told on multiple occasions, and pleaded with him to kill the story. Um, so there was a lot of pressure on John and for that newsroom to not publish this story. And I'm very thankful that they fought like I fought to actually get it into print. And they didn't, they didn't want, they didn't leave me hanging. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amazing, uh, crazy story. So maybe um, just before going to other question, like just what's the latest on the Terrano, Terranos situation or trial? Where are we today? Um, so Elizabeth's criminal case, uh, so that's being run by the Department of Justice, has been postponed a number for, of times. For fraud? For fraud or? For fraud, yeah. I think, yeah. I don't actually follow it as closely as I should, but I think, I think there's like 11 counts of fraud. Mm -hmm. um, and so the case against her is still ongoing. It's but, still ongoing, but it's scheduled for March. And the company? The company luckily shut its doors in, I think late 2018 or maybe early 2019. I can't exactly remember. Yeah, it took so it took a while because it they, took a they, long time. they were able to get a new loan and to just spend all <laughs> these millions of dollars. Yeah, that's a part that I often forget about that. But after all of this came out, they still they got a hundred million dollar loan, which is pretty astounding. Um, yeah. So basically, articles first articles come out uh, October two thousand fifteen, and it takes three more than three years to completely shut down with in the middle a new big loan. So yeah. Yeah, and even longer than that for this criminal case to finally go to court. And so you, what are you doing now? Um, well, now I actually started my own little diagnostic startup, which is pretty fun. Uh, yeah. So after I, I left Theranos, I went and I started working in a lab at Stanford that uh, has essentially repurposed magnetic hard drive technology to do diagnostics. Okay. Um, so I ended up spinning out a little company with my professor trying to commercialize that technology. And it's kind of funny because in a lot of ways, it sounds very similar to Theranos. It's you can measure multiple things at the same time. It's quantitative. You can do it in point of care settings. Um, but yeah, Elizabeth sold me so well on that vision that I'm still chasing after it, but I'm using a real technology that has, my professor has been publishing papers and filing patents for over 15 years on it. So we have a really strong technology foundation and now it's, it's a matter of, of commercialization and taking it to the next level. Well, I think that's, that's fascinating that, yeah, you, you were very excited about the mission and, and believe that a, re a re revolution was needed in that sector. And then you, you worked very hard in the Stanford labs to, to try to make it happen and, and now launching your startup. So I think it's, it's really commendable. And I- Yeah, thank I you. Well. It's been quite the journey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but keeping, uh, keeping on track. Um, I, I kind of want to, to go back to, so, because for me it's just so crazy I, ca I still cannot believe that there's so many crazy things in this story but I in okay where do I start this point so what's crazy is how could a Tehanos machine end up in a Walgreens which is basically a, a pharmacy for the European yeah how could a machine like that be in a public shop when the technology doesn't even work, doesn't even exist. So basically, how could the regulator fail so, 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 so big? And, and basically, I'm also asking that because it's linked to the question, so then do you do the regulators change since Tehanos? Could the Tehanos scandal happen again? And basically, I'm even more worried because we are in a COVID uh, pandemic crisis where there's definitely a rush for vaccines or treatments. And so basically knowing that regulators could be so wrong and when we need some, when we need quick solutions for the pandemic, it kind of gets me worried. <laughs> so, yeah. 
Um, so any good news on that side? Yeah, uh, so you you touched on a number of things there, but one, I want to make one thing really clear is that the, none of these devices ever made it into a Walgreens store. And Okay, thank you. Okay, because yeah. you said your first day was the launch of the product in Walgreens. Yeah, that was part of the ruse is that they were supposedly going to be in these Walgreens wellness centers and you could prick your finger, it would go into the device and then you'd have the results by the time you walked out. But in reality, they were getting needles in their arms uh, the blood was being drawn and then someone would drive it from Walgreens to Theranos and then we would do the testing at Theranos. So they never okay. ever was one of these inside of a Walgreens. And in my opinion, it would have been impossible to get them to work inside of a Walgreens. Yeah, okay. They just didn't have the right type of equipment and... Um, so it was a fake launch. It was a fake launch, yes. Okay. It was definitely a fake launch. And on top of that, when we launched, we weren't even running the tests on the Theranos platform. We were just collecting at Walgreens and then running on third-party equipment. So they just, they didn't really launch anything. Um, but um, on your other point, I do, so a lot of things had to go wrong in order for Theranos to happen. And if you think about all the executives failed, the board members failed, the investors failed, the media failed. So all of these systems that are supposed to keep the other mm -hmm. systems in check, they all failed. And in some ways, I feel like they failed so dramatically that there's no way it could ever happen again. Like there isn't gonna be another company that's able to raise a billion dollars and not have a single investor on the board. No one is gonna be able to raise a billion dollars without a single investor ever seeing an audited financial statement. No investor is ever gonna put together this board of directors that really doesn't have much control and doesn't know what they're doing. Um, but I hope you're right. I, yeah, I hope I'm right too. But since all of the COVID stuff started happening, my mindset has kind of started shifting a little bit. And I've been seeing what's happening and it, in a lot of ways, it does feel like it's a really good time to commit fraud right now, especially in, <laughs> Okay, we could, we could quote you like tell us we saw Laura Taylor. It's a very have you been looking for a time to commit fraud? Now is the time. <laughs> Buy in. Um, but it's just yeah, with with regards to the to the diagnostics and to the therapeutics and to the vaccines, there's just there's so much going on. There's so much stimulus money out there. I could see how it would be really easy for a company to fudge a little bit of data so they can get the next hundred like 10 or 20 million dollar grant or whatever it is to continue that research um regulations are being dropped so that things can move faster we know that the regulations on the for, from, from the fda for regulating the diagnostics have been kind of been going up and down initially they really lowered um regulations for things like the antibody tests and then the the market was flooded with bad tests and so then the the FDA essentially took them all off the market and, and raised the bar a little bit. And then I know that we've heard that the, the president has been talking to the FDA about mm. lowering the standards for getting a vaccine through so that we can get vaccines faster. So in science, unfortunately, things just take time. Mm -hmm. And we're in a situation now where we need solutions fast. Yeah. And so in order to get fast solutions, you have to decrease regulation. You have to kind of flood these markets with a lot of funding and a lot of funding, lower regulations, I think make for a dangerous recipe for, for fraud. But hopefully- so Let's keep our eyes open and uh, journalists out there, please do your job yes. now more than ever because it's, it's, it's a very critical time. So. I think our time is, is running out, um, but um, I want to push you on that. Like, what would you say to a friend who worked in a startup and was serious concern about the, the work he's doing? What would you tell him to do? Um, well, one, I would say, so one thing that I did that I really recommend to other potential whistleblowers is find people who are senior to you, who you can trust. And for me, I built strong relationships with a lot of senior scientists, with my managers who were all seeing the same things that I was seeing. And I could go to them and have very honest conversations and they could either confirm 
or help educate me. But most of the time it was what you're seeing, you know, we're seeing too. This is not how science is done. And so I think it's important that you can be really confident in yourself before you go, you know, and into any kind of whistleblowing and activity. I would say also it's if you are a group of whistleblowers, it's not then it's less about one individual or it's not about attacking one person, but it's stronger if it's a group of people who are raising up issue as well. Yeah, I think that would have been a great thing at Theranos, but everyone was so terrified. There was such a strong culture of fear that I don't think we would have been able to pull together a group. And as soon as Elizabeth caught wind of a group getting pulled together, we would have been in a courtroom. Yeah. So I think in some situations, I'm, I'm sure that that can work out better. In my situation, I don't think it would have happened and I think it could have ended poorly. Um, but then secondly, actually, I think knowing about resources like the Signals Network is super, super important. And when I was going through this, you know, I was like 22, 23, 24 years old and I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't even really see myself as a whistleblower. I didn't quite yeah. frame it in that context. And I wanted to, I didn't know who to reach out to. I, I didn't want, I was too afraid to even really talk to lawyers. And so now when, you know, a lot of people often reach out to me and say, you know, I'm seeing some shady things mm -hmm. at my company. Can you help me out? It's really nice for me to say, hey, contact the Signals Network because they can put you in touch with lawyers reporters um they can really just be they so can I, I again this month i put in touch one uh, with a lawyer yeah yeah great yeah i'm glad to hear that um and then i don't know because then they talk and uh, they receive the legal advice and if they want to talk to another lawyer because for any reason i can find another lawyer yeah and what i didn't know is that there are a lot of very a lot of protected whistleblowing channels through the government that i didn't yeah. know about and if i had spoken to to someone like the signals network i'm sure i would have been educated on on options like that for me um so yeah so speak to a lawyer but a good yeah, one a, a lawyer no, yeah a one who no, understand what's at stake and who knows the different whistleblowers law and right and uh, it's different in every country. It's also different in every every state in the U.S. And so, it's it's actually a very complex uh, journey. And so, you better make some research uh, on your computer at home, not at work, <laughs> and um, and, uh, and and connect with a trusted community of experts like the signals network um, but i would also encourage you to look at uh, resources that um, a group called government accountability project gap uh, put out in the us for journalists and, and whistleblowers which are really great resources in each country it's different so in france for example i recommend to look at uh, greenpeace resources that were put out to to explain how the law legislation is and protect whistleblowers in france for the EU, uh, there's a new directive uh, which allow new protection for whistleblowers. So I could refer you to some resources for journalists that explains um, a little bit more about what it means for the journalists and their sources. Um, so there are resources out there. There are some uh, good groups. There's, there are unfortunately not a lot of groups who really can put you in touch with a lawyer for free, but um, there is some, so please uh, please know that it exists through the Signals Network. Sometimes I connect you with other groups we work with in different countries, um, but we are uh, operational in 11 countries so far. Um, also, we because it's such a complex legal world, we're actually putting together and, and releasing in a few weeks a, a whistleblower index. And the idea is to compare countries for the way they treat whistleblowers, because I think there's a, a need to discuss more about the reality of the journalist sources. And, um, and the, I think the word whistleblowers still have a pretty pejorative, like negative yeah. aura. And uh, I hope uh, people like you and many other can help change that perce perception and we, that we could focus more on amazing contribution you made basically you helped 
um, stop a huge fraud, we could have armed people. And, uh, and, and, and that's really the case for most of the whistleblowers. They, they prevent major uh, damage and, and harm. So there should not be uh, any kind of negative aura around that. Um, yeah. uh, any last advice for someone? You, you never think of becoming a whistleblower. It's not like, uh, Oh yeah, I want to become a whistleblower. It's it's a journey of trying to 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 help your company. In most of the cases, people want to honestly help their company do a better job. To then go to the regulators or or to a journalist. So I don't know. I want to let you end this conversation with um, an advice or an optimistic note here. Yeah, I mean, I think what really worked out for me is that I end up. I was very confident in myself and I, and I trusted my gut and I never doubted myself. And I think it would have been really tough if with, when there was so much outside pressure, if I began self self doubting, that is when every, I would have kind of collapsed. So just, you got to trust your gut, stick to your guns um, and you'll be okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Tyler. And sure, congratulations on your amazing journey and I wish you all the best for your new chapter and Thank please you. Yeah. everybody you should absolutely listen to the podcast which is really really cool and it, which was just released in August so it's very up to date if you have a four hours drive because it's it's three hours and a half uh, please absolutely you should listen to to um, Tyler podcast which is on audible and uh, thank you again and take care. And I hope to see you soon in person. Yeah, I hope so. That'd be great. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.